Welcome back. This is the last episode in our series covering the installation of our Vantage Pro 2 Plus wireless weather station. Now in the previous episodes we've covered the mundane tasks of you know, digging a hole in the ground, mounting the weather station, verifying communications. In this episode we're actually going to get to the fun stuff. I'm going to show you how to take what's in this box, connect it to our console, and start collecting weather data. I'm also going to show you how to install the WeatherLink software and I'm going to give you a glimpse of the software package that I use to store my observations in a database. So sit back, let's get started. Okay, first things first, let's open our WeatherLink box and see what's in it. We have our USB cable for connecting to our data logger and the data logger that gets inserted into the console. And instructions. Okay, let's get our station console ready to go. Let's flip it over. We're going to take the back cover off. We're going to do a couple things here. We're going to insert our weather logger and get ready to put the batteries in. So we'll get our weather logger that we had out of the box here. And you'll see it's just got pins that'll line up in that area. Honestly, that kind of fit in there, snapped into place. I'm kind of impressed how that went in. Okay, now we'll come back to our batteries. We'll put those in after we put AC power to our system and get it configured. So let's flip him over. We'll insert our power plug on the bottom of the unit. Flip it back. Now it's important to remember that you have two options to enter setup on the console. The first is when the console is first booted, and the second is when the console is already up and displaying data. To enter setup when the console is booting, first apply power to the console. Now the console will light up all of the elements on the LCD screen and then beep twice. When you see a scrolling message at the bottom, you can either press and hold done to skip the message or wait until the console says receiving from. And at that point, you are in the setup program. Once in the setup program, as we are right now, you can press done and bar to navigate forwards and backwards through the major sections of the setup program. You can use the left and right buttons to navigate through the different options and press plus or minus to change those settings. You can also enter the setup program while the console is displaying data. To do so, simply press and hold the done and the minus button at the same time. And you'll see we're back to receiving from and we can begin navigating through the different configuration options. We're gonna set the date and time right now. So you'll see if we hit the left and right arrow keys it lets us go through the selections. So let's go through here. We'll select hour and now we're into PM, so it's going to be, it is 2, we'll put it as 13 PM. We'll select November 11th. And the year, 2019. All right, let's go to the next one. And I pulled these settings off of my old console, so I'm going to trust that I did this right a few years ago. I'm going to set this latitude as 40 north. And it looks like if you're over here, it just does the 10th 
value. You actually have to press the arrow key to get over and change each individual digit. So north is set. We'll set our longitude Okay, time zone is wrong. We are Eastern time, GMT minus five. Daylight savings is auto. Now this is the way it was set up on my other station, daylight savings off, but I'm thinking that this auto setting will take care of that. Elevation, we're currently setting at 602 feet above sea level. I usually get this setting by going to Google Earth and positioning over the house or wherever I want to get the elevation for. And in the lower right hand corner it gives you the elevation for the area. I think that's pretty close. Wind cup size as large because we've not changed the defaults from Davis. Ring collector, um, keeping this in standard measurements. I did not switch it over. So each tip of the bucket is going to be one one hundredth of an inch of precipitation. Now we need to set the date for the rain season. This is the date in which the rain totals will reset to zero. Now Davis recommends January 1st for most installs, however there are exceptions. You'll want to consult the console manual for reasons to change this. For our install, we'll leave it set to January 1st. Serial bond rate 19.2 We'll get into this setting a little bit later, but for now the default will be fine. And now we are done. So we'll hit done and hold it down until, until we get uh, readings, and it looks like we are. Looks like temperature and humidity aren't registering yet. We'll give it a little bit of time to see if those pop in. So now that we got our settings made, we'll go ahead and put batteries in this. I always buy the Duracell batteries. I don't want to go cheap on the batteries and end up having them leak on me. So you can, I don't know if you can see that in the video or not, but it does tell you what direction the batteries need to go. So we will slide those in. There's one, there's two, took a little bit of extra effort there, but there's the third battery. And we'll go ahead and put the door back on the unit. should be it. To issue the clear command it says we want to make sure that the wind speed is showing. And you see that it is right here, but if for some reason yours does not give a unit a speed, hit the wind button until it does. You see where I pressed it here, now we're back to degrees. So I'll press it once again and now we're back to miles per hour. So I'm going to press, now to clear it we're going to press the second, and then the high low which is the clear. You can see we're getting a countdown now. To clear the station, I'm going to continue holding until it says clearing now. There we go. Now this will take a few seconds to complete and then just this just clears out all the high low readings and everything from the station in preparation of connecting it up. Okay now that everything's cleared we're back to our readings. Now, I've already have a console hooked up to my old uh, system, so I'm not going to open this cable. But you'll see this cable here. That connector will plug into your data logger. And the USB connection will actually go to your computer. Or I'll show you another way to do it here. Now, the beauty to all this is that you can have as many consoles on this station as you would want. Now, you remember in a previous video, 
we set the transmitting IDs up on the weather station itself and we had to come in here to the console and configure what transmit IDs we wanted this to listen to. So if we wanted to add another console, we would set it to the same transmit IDs as our new station, and it would be able to pick up on this as well. So I'll give you a kind of a sneak peek into another video that we're going to do here soon. It's going to be implementing APRS. Now we'll get into what that is, of course, in that video, but for that we're going to have to buy a new data logger and a new console. So that ought to be exciting, so look forward to that. Well, as they say, out with the old, in with the new. Now that we have our new console configured, let's take down our old one and connect and mount up our new console. The WeatherLink software no longer comes bundled with the data logger. However, the software is free for download from WeatherLink.com. Now you'll need to create an account on this website in order to gain access to the files. There will be two files that you can download, a full version and an upgrade version. If this is a new installation, you'll want to download the full version. Once downloaded, double click the install file. Now you may be prompted to install an older version of .NET, but that's okay. Let it complete if you're prompted to do this. Now the install is pretty easy at this point. Once you agree to the license, it's pretty much next, next, finish. Once finished, click close and open the application. Once weather link is open, the software detects that a data directory for a weather station does not exist and asks if you would like it to create one for you. Select yes and we'll walk through this wizard. In the next screen you'll have to decide what you want your station name to be. Now this can be anything you like. Also on the screen you can see that once you name your station the data directory will be stored in the weather link folder which is on the root of the C drive by default. Let's go ahead and continue with the walkthrough. Now we'll need to tell it what model of weather station you have. By specifying the model it'll set some accessories by default that are common for that particular model. If you have any additional accessories, go ahead and specify them now. If you don't already have your console connected to your WeatherLink computer, do so now. Here we will specify the communications type and we will test the connection. If everything is set up right, it'll tell you that a station was found. If you don't see this message, troubleshooting the connection will be necessary. However, troubleshooting will be outside the scope of this video. Next, we will have to choose our units of measurements. I don't want to ignite a war here on which units are best, so select the units that best meet your requirements. For our UV sensors, we need to specify your skin type. As you can tell from the video, I'm pretty fair skin, so I selected type 3. So select the type that best suits you. Next, we specify the station or stations that we want to auto-download. Select your station and add it to the list. Now below, I've always left the storage directory as default, so unless you have reason not to, you can leave it as is. Next, let's configure our barometer settings by entering the elevation of your station. Now I get this number by going to Google Earth and mousing over the approximate location of my station, and the elevation is going to be displayed in the lower corner, and that's the number I use. For sea level barometer, I leave this blank. Now we have to set the calibration of our station. If you did not modify your collector from the defaults, you can select yes, we're using one one hundredth of an inch of precip in the collector. Setting the temperature and humidity calibration has always puzzled me a bit. I paid over a thousand dollars for this station and I would expect these readings to be accurate. 
Since I don't have anything to contradict that expectation, I'm not going to change anything here. Now we've already discussed the Rainfall season earlier, but as with pretty much everything we configured on the console, we can change it in software. Here I entered the year-to-date rainfall from my previous station. If you have another station, you too can pull that number. If not, you'll have to enter it from another source. Next, we can set the time on the console. Now, if the time on the console is wrong, you can reset the time and date here, as well as the time zone and daylight savings configuration. Now, as a side note, my old console would slow down a couple minutes every few weeks, so I was always resetting it. I'm very curious to see how the new console does in this regard. Now we have to decide if we want to clear the archive memory. Now I clear the memory just to make sure that I'm getting data from this time forward. Next, we have to decide on the archive interval. Personally, I want to collect data as often as I can since I want to display that data in as close to real time as possible. Remember, the more frequent the setting, the more storage it will take for your observations. Next, we will set the location of the station specified in latitude and longitude. Now you can see the settings that I entered here on the console during our setup earlier, but I'll come back here and refine it as much as possible later. Now we'll set the wind cup. If you didn't modify your wind cup from what was included with the station, you won't have to change it here. Also here, if you were unable to orient your anemometer due north during the install phase, you can set the offset here to account for that. Next is the alarm settings. Here you can set an alarm for various readings. Now I'm leaving this blank as this feature really doesn't apply for my particular application. As our last setting, we are asked if we want to configure the station to upload to weatherlink.com. Now this is something that I don't require, so I have skipped it. Well, we're finished, but we're presented with the opportunity to go back if we need to change something. If you're happy with the setup, go ahead and select No. Now that we're finished, if you want to see the dashboard of your data, you can click the Dashboard button in the upper menu. That's it. We finished our setup. Now keep in mind, if you need to change any of these settings later, you can do so by selecting Setup from the menu. That covered setting up a new station within Weatherlink, which should cover most of you. I still want to go over how to configure the software if you are replacing an existing station. Now this video is already running a bit longer than I'd hoped, so I'm going to have to break that out into another video that I'll release a little bit later. Well, I promised you a quick peek at a software package that I made to take data files created by Weatherlink and put them into a MySQL database. Well, here it is. This is WX to SQL. My need was to be able to make my observations available so I could display them on my website and perhaps other apps in the future. I didn't know of an app that I could do it with, so I wrote one. What you are seeing here is the main window of WX to SQL as it is monitoring the current data file for changes. As soon as it sees a change, it'll process the file and input the new data into our database. Now let's take a look at some of the options that we have. In the latest version, you can see that I was working on multi-station support. Here you could configure up to five station directories for monitoring. I skipped the database configuration tab so that I didn't have to blur any of those fields out. But in the remaining tabs, you can see that we can configure the logging level, options for pulling in almanac data from the United States Naval Observatory, and variables for overriding the archive interval. Next, let's take a look at some of the utility functionality that I built in. Another feature is the ability to take a weather link file and export it into a CSV file. There are also options for different ways that we can format the data. I was also working on a health check feature that would analyze a data file and identify any problems that the file might have. This was a prelude for being able to edit, merge, and repair the data files. The reports that were generated were easy to read, in PDF format, and it contained diagnostic data for each day. What good would a database be if you couldn't import past files? Well, here you can see you have the ability to import all of your files into a database. 
Of course, we talked about monitoring current files for changes. You could do that on this screen. Notice that you have the options to monitor each directory that we configured earlier. You probably noticed that I talked about the development of this program in the past tense. Well, the version I showed you was one that I was working on but never released. During the development process, I got fed up with Java and just decided to trash it. So I began working on a new version of the program written specifically for Windows and written in C Sharp. Now I'm almost done with the library coding on this and I'll be starting on the UI soon. So look forward to this release at a later time. Well, that wraps up the final video in our series covering the installation of our Davis Weather Station. I hope you enjoyed watching the video as much as I did making them. If you did, make sure you like and share the video. Now, if you have any questions or comments concerning the installation, please feel free to leave them in the comments section below. And I'd like to hear from you if you've had experience installing other brands of weather stations and how it compares to this one. If you enjoy weather observation and ham radio, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the alert button so you're notified each time a new video is released. I've got several videos planned and even a couple that I've started to work on, so look forward to those being released soon. But for now, I'm Mike, KD9BLW73.